partisan divisions in American foreign policy. Do Republicans and Democrats agree on anything? Joining me to talk about this in studio is Dina Smeltz, Senior Fellow for Public Opinion and Foreign Policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She formerly worked in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. State Department. The Council has just conducted, has conducted surveys for many years on America's public opinions about U.S. foreign policy. You recently released the survey for 2015. What's the bottom line? Bottom line is that Americans, regardless of political affiliation, share a common view of what the most important threats and goals are for U.S. foreign policy, and they think the United States should remain committed to being active in the world. But there are specific partisan divisions, especially on immigration, climate change, uh, the role of Israel, and how we should deal with Iran. And you're seeing that in a lot of the debate discussions, obviously, too. But agreeing on an active role in foreign affairs, 64 percent. Correct. Right. And that is uh, typical. We've been conducting the survey since 1974, but others have conducted it all the way back, since 1947. And about between six and seven and ten Americans generally say that the United States should remain involved in world affairs. And that's contrary to, uh, you often hear yeah. stories about Americans being isolationists, but Americans generally do support staying involved. And is that on the increase? Um, it increased from last year. Last year was a low point. 58% of Americans um, said that we should take an active part, but 41% said that we should stay out of world affairs. And when we looked at that more closely, that was because Americans thought, the Americans who said we should stay out thought we should focus on problems at home. There was still a lag uh, for the public of feeling economic recovery. And they thought uh, staying involved in world affairs might in fact mean getting militarily involved and they were war weary from all the... They don't want troops. Right. We don't want to lose any more people, right? Right. The only time they will really support troops is if they sense a direct threat, like against terrorism. Uh, what surprised you about the survey the most? Um, I think one thing that surprised me was just how wide apart we are on climate change. It's just... Um, as scientists continue to say that this is a... 98% of scientists tell us this. Why did any, anybody disagree with that? Some people mm -hmm. still question whether it's even really a problem, um, especially Republicans tend to feel that way, especially people who identify as strong Republicans, where Democrats see it as a more urgent issue that needs change right, right away. That we, that we need to do something to impact change, even if it costs a lot of money. Vladimir Putin and Russia do not really show up on the critical threats list? No, um, this was before. I wanted to mention one other thing that was surprising. We can come back to it was uh, the attitudes on Israel are very interesting at this well, point right. in time. Um, well, Americans have always been very positive toward Israel as a country. But this last survey, we asked Americans whether they view um, Israel playing a positive role in the Middle East or a negative role. And this has always been a non-political issue, really, for both parties, but we're seeing now that Democrats are more likely to say Israel plays a negative role and Republicans say it plays a positive role. And then I think part of the Democratic criticism could be because Democrats now support by a majority, the creation of an independent Palestinian state, where the Democrats have become more supportive of that, everybody else is divided, and the public at large is divided. So it's really just the Democrats that have shifted on that. And that's just been very interesting given Iran and uh, the somewhat of a rift between uh, Netanyahu and Obama and how all of that ties together. What about immigration? Immigration is something that we follow really closely at the council. Um, it's another one of the really wide partisan divides. Uh, Republicans tend to see immigration as one of the illegal immigration as one of the top threats to the United States like by about 60 percent. And that has shifted a little bit over time since we asked it in the 90s, but it's generally pretty solid in the 60s. The Democrats, since uh, George Bush took over, 
um, was president, they have, um, and there's a great graph in the report, so I'm tracing the curve, but they have declined. So at the beginning, in the early 90s, Democrats and Republicans both thought immigration, illegal immigration was a threat to the United States. But now Democrats, only about one in three Democrats think illegal immigration is a threat, and they support a path to citizenship, where Republicans are really divided on, uh, actually they, generally support deportation more than a path to citizenship, but again, there's interesting differences within Republicans on that. Bush supported a path to citizenship. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And even though net immigration from Mexico has now gone to zero levels. When it comes to favoring force, though, we uh, Americans want diplomacy. Americans tend to, their, their first response is for diplomacy, but this is a difference, again, um, between Republicans and Democrats, and I think it's a value and a way they perceive as best for us to project our power on in the world. So, for example, Ukraine, a big issue today. Um, Americans support diplomatic and economic sanctions. Uh, they support providing some military assistance to Ukraine. But Republicans go further, and they support training and equipping um, Ukrainian soldiers to fight against Russia. Um, and if Russia attacks uh, an ally, a NATO ally, like one of the Baltic allies, Republicans are more likely to say we should commit troops to defend that NATO ally. So that's a big difference. And just in terms of philosophy, Republicans tend to think that to stay safe, we need to have superior military power in the world, and Democrats tend to support more diplomatic approaches like strengthening the United Nations, working with allies in alliances, um, signing, both sides support signing trade agreements, but that's an example. So. What about independence? Independence are really interesting. So I have come to study public opinion fairly recently. I used to study opinion abroad. And I always thought independents would be very interested uh, consumers of news and, and uh, information about politics and foreign policy. But actually, our survey shows that uh, among independents, about 44 percent uh, either choose to, they say that they are closer to Republicans or Democrats, so half split each way. And among those, especially Republicans, they tend to be more hardline Republicans. So they're kind of secret partisans. They may not like the choices they have in terms of candidates, but in terms of their views, they definitely have views like they're partisans. But then there's a little bit more than half that we call the pure independents, which don't feel close to either party. And they are actually some of the least interested, least likely to vote, least likely to register to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of disaffected people that um, they want us to stay out of any kind of conflict abroad. So they really don't support the use of force. Does this survey back up what we have in American politics today at Quagmire, that we have a severe split, a Congress divided and nothing happening? I think it's hard to say. This is always the conundrum of public opinion research. We can't really say whether the elites um, in Congress, for example, affect the views of their constituents so that they've created these bipartisan divides even among the public, or whether it's the other way around that the um, the elites are responding to public opinion and that it's public opinion taking them. But either way, it's not a, a good picture for moving forward. Are there a lot of more differences inside the Republicans than inside the Democrats? Yes, the Democrats are really cohesive. And I think that's interesting because we don't have that many challengers on the Democratic side as well. So the Democrats, the only thing really dividing them are the view of Israel, uh, strong, Democrats, who tend to be more liberal, are more negative toward Israel. Among Republicans, there's quite a few things. Um, on immigration, the moderate Republicans are, uh, they're divided between whether illegal immigrants should leave or whether they should be granted citizenship. On climate change, they think perhaps it is a problem. Uh, the moderate Republicans say perhaps it is a problem and that we should 
uh, take some gradual action, and then the other half of the moderates um, say, well, maybe it's not really a problem. Where when you look at strong Republicans, they don't, they question whether climate change is even a problem that needs to be uh, addressed. And then another um, example is the Iran deal. So we asked, we conducted our survey in May and June, so before the deal was uh, signed. And uh, at that point, Americans, a majority, did support the deal. But among Republicans, those who consider themselves strong Republicans oppose the deal. And now opinion has changed um, a lot since the deal was signed. A lot more people are paying attention to the issue. A lot more politicians are speaking out against it. And so we've actually seen across a number of polls that support for the Iran deal has fallen. But the trend continues that Democrats are more supportive. It's a very objective survey, right? Yes, it's, it's a nonpartisan survey. What uh, does it tell you about the 2016 elections? Is there uh, anything you can forecast? The only, we don't, we're not in the prediction business, um, but what it does show is that right now, so I think among the Republican Party, we were talking about some of those differences. I think the wide range of opinions that we hear the primary candidates talking about now, like on immigration, um, are reflective of that. And uh, that right now, each candidate is speaking to its particular slice of the electorate. Um, they're kind of micro-targeting people who think like them on specific issues. But once the presidential election occurs, uh, they're going to have to appeal to the average American and not to those people who hold these more hardline um, opinions. And so that's going to be very hard to reconcile. Do you like this as much as working in intelligence? Um, this is, uh, I can talk about what I work on a lot now and I don't have to lock up my hard drive at night. So in that way, it's, it's been a lot freeing. Thank you, Dina. Thank you.